Hello, it's Keith here and this is lesson 8 of the Photon series in which we look at my little simple um, Tron game and we we're looking at the code today that's going to be doing the pixel plotting that in effect draws the line drawing, the pixel leading to get back if the player has collided with something and also the common code that handles the key input and um, passes that on to the multi-platform code. Now we're looking at the ZX Spectrum version today which you can see here looks pretty good but as of course with always the Spectrum does have um, color clash problems because of the color attributes you can see if I go near these boxes and if I crash into them as well you can see they're actually changing color so um, whereas on other systems that are full bitmap screens we have got that limitation but I was able to at least get the color in there so I was worried the game might end up being black and white which would have been a little bit disappointing because the spectrum can do a little bit more so that's what we've got today we're going to be looking at how I've written the code to do this and um, we'll go over and have a look at it now let's just go over to the source code okay so here's the Spectrum version of the game. Now here is the variables that I defined at the start. Now we're defining the screen size here. Screen width 32 defines what sort of scale the screen is. There's different versions of some of the code scaling the objects if the screen's really small, uh, making them wider if the screen is wider. But the screen 32 is the default size, 256 by 192, very nice common screen size. We're defining a few bytes of memory for um, user RAM. There's a 256 byte allocation, but I think it actually only uses 64, but that's far more. The, yeah, it's, there's plenty available on all the systems I'm working on, so it's not really a problem. And then we're defining the four colors. Now the game uses up to four colors, and on the Spectrum version, we're defining the color attributes we're gonna use. Now color zero, black, is, use, is the background color, and then any other color is using color one within the bitmap area, and then we're defining the matching color attribute to one of these, so that's what we're doing there. We're then clearing the user memory here, and we're running the main menu routine, which will show the title screen, and it will wait for fire and things like that. Now this is the start of the main game loop here. You can see it's pretty short. That's the game loop, and um, what we're doing first is we're incrementing the tick. Now the tick is used basically the player and the CPU move every other tick but when the boost is enabled when you hit enter that will make the player move super fast and that will update every tick so that's what that does. Now basically here we're defining the speed based on whether boost is on or off and that's because when boost is on we have to de decrease the counter in the corner and the code isn't that fast that does the vector fonts. A you know, bitmap font would have been faster but I wanted to use vectors for everything so um, yeah, the, the vector font isn't the fastest thing in the world unfortunately so um, that's what we're using anyway. Um, and then here is the delay loop and this is also handling the key presses. Now if I just run the game again you'll see how the um, controls work in this game if I just press um, enter here. Now if I press the right key here you'll see I moved right but I only moved right once even though I'm still holding it down. I have to release and press again and that's so uh, we've got precise controls because if we just keep moving right of course we'll quickly crash into ourselves. So um, we've got the debouncing here and that's um, what this key timeout does. Basically it's checking here if there's no key presses occurring then we clear the key timeout otherwise we don't um, and what we're doing here is we're reading in a keys that are pressed into D so D is going to be processed later on. Now once this delay loop has occurred we're then going to check the key timeout and if the key timeout hasn't been cleared we're going to skip all the way down to here and we're going to ignore those key presses but if key presses are going to be processed then we're clearing the boost here and then we're going to process the direction. So what we're doing here is we're setting HL to the direction variable and IX to the accelerations. And if left is pressed, we're decreasing the player direction and if right is pressed, we're increasing it. And this is so we can have a 360 degree rotation and we'll just keep going round and round in circles. But basically, of course, this would go below 255 and uh, it will go round and round in circles, but we need it to be 0 to 3. The rest of the work is being done by set player direction and it's also copying the accelerations as required. So most of the code work is being done by set player direction here. But you'll see if left and right are pressed, we're setting that key timeout. However, if fire is pressed, we're not setting that timeout because we actually need to be able to hold down fire because we need to keep moving fast. So that's what's going on there. Now, if fire is pressed, we check if there's any boost power, and if there is, we're setting boost to zero, which turns it on. The rest of the work of boost is being handled by the player routine here, so there's no de decrementing of the boost power, and there's no updating of the screen in this. That's all in these routines here. So that's the end. We're, we're handling the player drawing, handling the CPU drawing, and then we're jumping back to the top for the next loop, and that's the entire game loop. So very straightforward, really. Now, for this um, version of the game, we're using keys QAOP here. 
Um, so we're reading in from the keyboard here. I'm not going to cover that here. If you want to see that, please see the simple series, the joystick example. I think I also covered it in the YQuest series, and I've covered Spectrum keyboard reading in the platform specific series before. So um, I'm not going to cover it again because um, I've been over it so many times. I, I think I've probably done it better in the past than I could do today. Now the real um, meat of today's episode is the P set for setting pixels and the point for reading pixels commands. That's what we're going to be looking at. Now, there's an alternate version here which uses D, E, and H, L for the X and Y position and A for the color, but the main one uses B and C for X and Y and D for the color. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set the color attribute. So if this is um, zero, if the color we're setting is zero, we don't want to set the color attribute, we don't want to black out things that are already there, so we're skipping over in that case, but otherwise we're going to be using the get call mempos, which calculates the memory address of a position within the color attributes. We had that from the um, bitmap, the simple bitmap series. This works in bytes, not pixels, and B is currently in pixels. So we're shifting B to the right a few times here to convert it to a byte X position. And then we're getting the memory address of the color attribute with that function there. And then we're setting it to D here. So D needs to be a color attribute, which is why we set them all the way up here to color attributes. So that's what's being used here. So that's now set the color attribute for the block that contains the pixel we're changing. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to set the pixel itself. So we're going to need to calculate the bitmap address of, in screen RAM of the byte that contains the pixel. And we're also going to need to work out how to change the pixel itself. So if we just skip down here for a moment to get pixel mask and we'll have a look at it. So this is doing the work. Now, once again, we're converting B so that it's a byte position for get screen pause and get screen pods will calculate the HL memory address of the byte that contains the pixel we want to change. Now the, the screen coordinates of the spectrum are a bit tricky, but this will calculate it. And that's what we use here. And that will return HL of the, which is the screen memory address of the pixel. What we want to do next is we want to look at the pixel within that byte. And we need to work out how we're going to change that one pixel. So what we're doing here is we've pushed B here and we're popping it back into A. So now we've got the bottom three bits of the X coordinate, which is the pixel within the byte. And we've just got a look up here for each pixel by bit position here. So that's the leftmost and that's the rightmost. And we're just looking up one of these and that will be a mask for the pixel we want to change. We then flip the bits and store that in D and that will be a mask for the pixels we want to keep. So we're running that just here. And now we've got the masks. So what we're doing next is we are checking the color and we're seeing if we want to set the pixel or we want to clear it because zero will clear it and everything else will set it. If we want to set the pixel, what we're doing is we're reading in, clearing out the pixel, or in the new pixel, which I guess is actually honestly going to always be one. Um, and then we're storing the result back to here. So if we want to set the pixel, we're reading in from the screen memory, ending with D, which is the mask for the pixels we want to keep, or in E, which is the pixel we want to change, and we're storing the result back to HL. If we're clearing the pixel, we read in from the screen, mask the pixels we want to keep, if I can stop dragging things, and then store it back to the screen. And so that is setting the pixel accordingly. Now, if we want to read a pixel, where's that point command gone? I can't find it. There it is. If we want to read a pixel, basically it's similar. We're using get pixel mask again. We are just reading in a byte from the screen, masking with the mask for the pixel that we want to look at. And if the result is zero, then the pixel is zero. Otherwise, it's not zero, it's one. This version is just defining background or foreground. It's not getting the color attribute because that wouldn't really be very helpful in this case because the game is uh, setting colors a bit crazy sometimes. So um, not, not particularly detailed there, but that's what we're doing there. So we've got get screen pos here, which will calculate the screen memory address. Get color memory pos, which will calculate the matching color attribute. They were copied from my other example. And here's a CLS routine here. This is um, setting all the color attributes to a default one. Although actually, we don't need to do that anymore. The original version, I think, was just black and white. So we had to do that. But the game doesn't really require that now. But that's clearing the screen. And that's the last part of this code. So there we go. So that's all there is to it. Um, it was a little bit trickier, this version, because of the color attributes. But um, to be honest, the Spectrum version was not the most complex version of this game. Some of them I had to do one weird thing, like the NES version was a flaming nightmare because of um, 
because of the tile map doesn't have enough tiles to fill the entire screen and because you can't write during V-blank. But the Spectrum version was pretty painless and um, I kind of enjoyed um, the colour attributes in this case. Um, often I find the colour, the Spectrum colours quite frustrating, but I, I find a kind of amused quirkiness by the fact that you know, this looks almost the same as the other versions, but you've just got the odd glitch here. Um, which I wasn't going to rewrite it for, but I, I kind of, there's a certain charm to that, I think. So um, I quite enjoyed writing this. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, if you're interested in seeing more of this, you can go to my website and download the source code, and you can use the source code in any way you want. I always say you're welcome to use parts of it in your own games or improve the game and do whatever you want with that as well. Have a lot of fun with it. Um, whatever you do, though, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoy your Spectrum programming and have a lot of success with it. Thanks for watching today, and goodbye.